you, Ariel. Happy to do so. Um, so, uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Aswani. I'm the CEO of African Venture Philanthropy Alliance. We are really thrilled to be partnering with Sankalp to host a series of webinars at, that are looking at issues specifically addressing challenges uh, affecting the most vulnerable in our, in our communities around this COVID-19 crisis. So this is the third um, webinar we've held over the last couple of weeks. We've addressed issues from uh, the informal economy to food. And we're really excited today uh, to be hosting a, a really great panel of people who are playing and, and actively involved in the space of education provision, the most vulnerable. And uh, AVPA um, is, is excited to be part of this process. We are a network of social investors who are working to increase the flow of financial and non-financial resources uh, into social investments on the continent. We are headquartered in Nairobi uh, and office, with offices in Johannesburg and Lagos. When we're, we're, we've, in the process of uh, responding to COVID-19, we have set up communities of response in Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria. So any of you who are interested to join uh, a group of people who are working towards uh, addressing issues related to COVID-19, please feel free to reach out to us uh, after this. You will see our Twitter uh, handles um, on, on the slides towards the end and our email address. So please feel free to reach out to either Nancy or myself. Uh, I'm very excited to um, be doing this series with, uh, in partnership with Ariel and Intellicup. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Nancy. And thank you so much to Intellicup once again for uh, enabling this um, series of webinars to keep going. And we're super excited to have all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, again, welcome to everybody. I see we have 39 per participants and growing. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll, I'll go straight into introducing our first uh, speaker, Henry Benson. Um, he is the director of CASME, Center for Advancement of Science and Mathematical Education. Um, he is here representing an organization based in South Africa. Uh, over to you, Henry. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for help, uh, for for having me, um, and thanks to ABPA and Sam, Sam Cup for I think facilitating this. It's very important conversations, um, uh, is particularly as we look at the most vulnerable and access. Um, um, Henry, so sorry, you're going to do a sorry, poll, sorry. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. Um, so just uh, just a couple of housekeeping items for the participants. Uh, we. Firstly, I'm Arielle from the Sankalp team. Thank you for joining today. Um, we will be taking questions in the chat box for all of the, uh, all of the participants today. So please uh, go ahead and, and put your questions in the chat box and we'll be fielding those to the speakers um, once, we, once they all wrap up and we'll have about at least half an hour for a Q&A for you all to pose your questions to, to the speakers today and put your contributions in. Um, we did want to start really quickly uh, today just with a quick poll before we get into uh, to, to Henry's presentation and you should see the poll pop up on your screen. What we want to know from all of you today is what you think some of the biggest barriers are uh, for e-learning specifically in informal settlements. So this whole series is focusing on the lower income consumers and we really want to see um, what what some of those biggest challenges are. So I will give you another about 30 seconds or so uh, to put your answers into the poll and then I'll share those results. Um, so just go ahead and select um, which which of these challenges you think is the most uh, the most challenging. Uh, is it access to electricity, access to internet, uh, access to hardware like a computer or a smartphone? Um, is it the teacher's ability to deliver content from, uh, you know, from historically a physical in-person platform to now an electronic one? Um, I am not seeing on my side that anyone has voted, uh, so I don't know if it's a glitch on my side. Uh, Margaret, are you able to see anything from your side by any chance? No, okay, well, in that case- uh, Yes, Ariel. Yes, we can see, uh, I can see about 31 people have voted so far. So maybe we give it a, another 10 seconds and we can close okay. the poll. Okay, perfect. We'll give it another, another five or 10 seconds. Thanks for that, George. Um, 
All right, I'll give it another two seconds and then I'm gonna end the poll. All right, so I don't know if it's a glitch on my side, but I can't see any results. Uh, so George, if you can see it, feel free to walk us through, but uh, I think it's a challenge on my side. I, I just shared it with you, Ariel. You should be able to see it now. I okay, can't see the results. Um, okay, go for it, go for it, Nancy, because I think I'm having a technical issue. It's now disappeared. <laughs> but I think it said 47% said all of the above. Okay, unsurprisingly, it's a, it's a mixed issue. Yeah. So super, so yeah. thanks everyone for your inputs. Uh, and Henry, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, so yes, as I've been introduced, I'm Henry Benson. I'm the director of um, CASNI. We're a nonprofit organization working in South Africa. Um, maybe I just just say that the work that we've been doing uh, currently, particularly under COVID-19 and the lockdown that we're facing here in South Africa is really, and what I'm, I'm reporting on and talking about is uh, work that's been done in partnership. So in partnership with a number of organizations, and you can see their logos on the screen there, in particular, I want to mention NASCI, which is the National Association for Social Change Entities and Education, uh, which is a membership-based um, body for nonprofits working in education, and also um, the Civil Society Coalition. Uh, which is an association of uh, organizations really working for the most vulnerable. Uh, next slide, please. So just to talk a little bit about the current activities, what we knew instinctively as an organization with long history of working in, um, uh, in, in rural and township communities is that we would, so what we saw, I think initially with the, um, with the lockdown and the closing of schools in particular, um, and we know this is affecting many, many, many millions of children around the world, is that we um, knew that content was becoming available in many forms. Um, so there was a, a very swift and agile turnaround from the private sector and from the nonprofit sector in, in making available um, content in various forms. What we were um, uh, anecdotally uh, aware of through our own work is that we needed to evaluate the level of access and engagement amongst teachers, learners, and parents. And so what we did was we started doing some research around this particular aspect to, um, in a way, sort of um, really bring some data to the table um, in terms of what we knew about um, access. And I'll talk a little bit about the results of that um, engagement uh, with groups of learners, teachers, and parents. Um, and this also then fed into another research project, which was the Jet Education Services Research Boot Camp, which was taking place, um, the Unlock the Lockdown and Open Up Your Thinking Boot Camp, which they organized with 150 or so researchers from around South Africa, as well as um, Africa and the world, um, who were looking into responses from the sector. Um, so the one thing that we, so as a result of this sort of opening up of the, of the sector in terms of making content available, um, we started engaging in a process of curating content, um, actually looking at the content to see what was available and asking some critical questions, for example, around zero rating, data, um, accessibility, also alignment to the curriculum, um, these kinds of, kinds of issues. Uh, the other thing that we were very keenly interested in, um, based on some of the results of the research that we'd been doing, um, is the level of engagement of parents and the ability of parents really to be able to um, keep continuity of learning going in the home, knowing very well that parents are not teachers. Um, parents are, and, um, and have been suddenly faced with um, the responsibility of now guiding learning in their homes and whether they had access necessarily to the resources that they needed, whether they be online or not. And then the other element that we're looking at is the low tech and data light kind of support initiatives that are out there. Um, uh, so what we've seen is lots of really fantastic um, online resources, um, but even um, in those cases, uh, they're not necessarily low tech or data light. Um, if we can move to the next slide, there'll be some re reflections on these initiatives. So what we found in our research was um, very promisingly, is that in the township and rural communities that we engaged with through the surveys and the research, um, is that 80% of learners had taken home with them prior to the lockdown, some paper-based resource. Um, and this was a critical learning um, in terms of how we respond 
um, and how we make learning opportunities available um, in the home. What we did find though in our research is that engagement across all platforms, um, particularly the electronic platforms, including radio and television was, was, was actually quite low. Um, with most learners um, indicating that they were only tuning in, that first of all, they were not even aware of the radio and television broadcast to some extent. Um, and I think about 50 to 60% of the learners that we engage with and teachers indicated that they were not aware. Um, those that were aware, very few of them were actually engaged in tuning into those um, sources. Uh, then just in terms of the um, content curation work, um, you know, uh, with all the resources that were available, what we um, realized is that there was a need to engage in a conversation, a critical conversation really, around what do we mean by zero rating? Um, so, um, and also what is data free? What is data light? What is free and open? So for example, we're quite concerned in terms of particularly vulnerable, vulnerable communities and communities that don't normally have um, the access to re resources is that with the sort of sudden opening up of the commercial space uh, with commercial providers saying, here's a resource, it's free, it's available for now. Um, and I think I emphasize the for now um, is because we're concerned that we have a sort of a hook into what um, maybe is a solution that doesn't have legs into the future in a post lockdown scenario or a return to school. And we still know that learners will um, be constrained. I mean, in the South African scenarios, we're looking at a very phased return to school, which could uh, stretch on for months and months and months. So we know many, many learners are still going to be out of school. Um, and so if those resources don't really have a true open um, quality in terms of um, creative commons licensing, for example, um, and that the, that paywalls maybe are reintroduced at some, at some point that we have a challenge. Even then with zero rating, I think we need to critically engage with the zero rating. So uh, the one thing is that telcos um, are offering resources um, zero rated, yes, and there's been a big campaign and push from our side, um, to, uh, from our side, from civil society, um, as well as um, government to get zero, more and more content zero rated. Uh, but the challenge there is also um, is what's the quality of that zero rating? What's the quality of the initial connection that a learner actually has? So for example, do they have a device? Um, these questions came up in the poll. Um, do they have electricity? Do they have, um, and, and how heavy is the data requirement of the content that needs to be downloaded? I mean, we, we can go onto a zero rated site, but it can still take you half an hour to download a PDF document that's very data heavy. Um, and then is it really an accessible document um, that you can actually use for learning? Um, and the last point in terms of the lessons learned is that what we found is that parents were really, really, really struggling. Even the most well-resourced parents um, uh, in suburban schools with access to internet connectivity um, were really struggling um, with how to actually engage with their, with their children. So if we look at the most vulnerable communities, um, what we um, realized, what we, what we found is that um, there aren't really non-specialist support resources in form of paper um, that uh, uh, parents can use to support um, learning in, in, in their homes. And so and maybe I should just mention one point. So recently, just very recently, um, the HSRC, the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa, have put out um, a, a paper based on some modeling they've done of the TIMS data. And what that has shown is that we are going to see massive impact in terms of learning gains uh, or learning losses, actually, uh, particularly with our most vulnerable communities. And next slide, please. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, I think we should be okay. So um, I think the one thing that we did find is in um, this, so with the flood of resources um, available is that we really are trying to drink from a fire hose. And that was the, um, what really motivated and drove us to start working on curating content. So really just being selective about what's available. Next slide, please. Great, so um, I think I'll wrap it up now with this last, um, so we say help needed, and I think this is kind of really where we're calling on um, all stakeholders and um, partners, um, and there is a lot of um, collaborative work happening already. But um, so uh, what, what, is, what the work that's currently um, happening um, is to try and create a trusted single entry point to approved content and support. Um, I think this is really critical, and I think maybe in some ways it's, um, uh, where we need our um, government sector and the official holders of education um, in um, our system 
uh, to really sort of support um, good, strong messaging around uh, what is expected of parents, what is expected of learners at this particular moment in time, um, and also point them to a uh, sort of a credible, trusted single entry point. Uh, the sort of responding to data light solutions, what we have seen is that there are a lot of um, sort of organic emerging WhatsApp messenger type um, solutions. Um, so maybe just to say that the, 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 the challenges that we're observing in this particular space are rather there isn't a coordinated or collaborative effort and also the pedagogical application of um, uh, how you use a messaging platform to deliver learning experiences um, is, is, is um, I think it needs some, um, some rethinking. Um, and what we've seen is there are some efforts now coming together and we're trying through our, well, our work with NASCI and other stakeholders to bring together um, the different players in this space to be able to structure learning on a messaging platform. At the moment, what you kind of, you, you do kind of get to see the sort of puff and pass kind of approach where um, uh, lots of information again goes across learners' timelines or parents' timelines or teachers' timelines. And really it's about sort of um, coordinating that and structuring learning. So providing small bits of information in very data light in, um, ways uh, to support learners. Um, and then I think just technical capacity for the sector to be able to convert um, content into a way that is accessible and meaningful and useful um, for the education sector. Uh, and then not only the technical capacity to, to deliver the content, but also then the learning and content support. So what happens once a learner gets some content um, um, through their uh, WhatsApp or their Telegram or their timeline um, is then how is that, um, what's the follow-up support that's required in order to, for us to really ensure learning um, takes place. Um, yeah, so I think we are faced with um, enormous challenges and we do know um, that there are going to be uh, learning losses, uh, but we, all these efforts are trying to sort of um, rally around mitigating those losses. And I think the key takeaways um, that we've learned from the research that we've been doing and the collaboration work that we're doing is that we really need um, uh, trusted messages, uh, trusted uh, message, uh, messages, messengers, um, as well as um, a single entry point into systems. And we do need to take cognizance of um, how data heavy um, this content is. So really bringing data light um, uh, innovative solutions um, to learners, particularly the most vulnerable. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very in insightful research. Uh, some of the things that you talked about uh, really hit home, especially regarding uh, non-specialist support for parents. I know I've seen a lot of, um, uh, in, you know, uh, parents on WhatsApp complaining and, you know, asking, are, are we the ones going back to school? We don't even know this material, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's interesting that you brought that up because Deborah from Dignitas uh, says that they are working in informal settlements in Nairobi to equip educators to support households and overcome the barriers that you're highlighting. Uh, They're currently piloting uh, virtual training and coaching tools targeted at educators who are fulfilling the role of community champions and working closely with parents and learners to keep learning uh, and well-being on track. So uh, maybe if we have another session on this topic, we may ask uh, Deborah from Dignitas to give us more insights on what they have also learned. Um, let me move on. Our next uh, speaker is Stacy. Uh, Stacy represents um, an organization in Nigeria called Edo Best, and it is part of the Bridge International Academies. Uh, go ahead, Stacy. And, and while Stacy's uh, talking and, um, and our next speaker, please, everybody who's listening, put your comments or questions in the chat box. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. Thank you.
Okay, thanks, Nancy. Um, so I'm managing, again, my name is Stacey Wilkay, and I'm managing director for Edo Best, um, which is an initiative that's been led by the Edo State Governor um, and spearheaded by their SUPEB, which is the government body that manages primary education in the state. So we, as Bridge International Academies, have partnered with them to support um, the education initiative that they have. And Edo Best is actually a program um, we just past our two-year anniversary. Um, and EdoBest is essentially, BEST stands for Basic Education Sector Transformation um, because the governor um, wanted wants to completely transform his education sector and improve learning outcomes. So we've had a strong foundation of sort of building teachers' tech literacy. Um, and also, so all the teachers in our classrooms have tablets that they use to teach their pupils. And the school leaders um, also have smartphones that um, they leverage to be able to manage their schools better. So we have that sort of as a structure in place before we, um, before COVID-19 came in, we had to start thinking through how to restructure or adapt our program um, to work at home. So Edo Best at Home is our adaptation. Um, and what we've what we've done to um, ensure that as many pupils as possible um, and as many families as possible are able to continue learning um, even though school isn't in session. So next slide. And then thinking about Edo Best, the Edo Best at Home, the first thing um, or our primary consideration was thinking about how to ensure um, that we are, that the program is accessible through as many channels as possible. Um, because while there may be some families who have access to online content, there are also many others who don't, um, who don't have smartphones um, or who may only have feature phones, um, so phones that don't have access to um, data. Um, and then still there are families who don't have phones at all, so wanting to make sure that some of our content is also available via radio. So I'll just walk through the different learning components um, that we've um, created here. Um, and they're all adaptations of our regular programming. So the first is um, interactive audio lessons. So these are literally um, lessons, four hours of lessons that we're creating every day, um, one hour for different age groups. So there's one hour for the nursery level, another hour for lower primary, one for upper primary, and then um, another hour for junior secondary. And these are lessons that cover um, the subjects, the content that pupils would be learning in their regular school day. So science, mathematics, English, social studies, and then also some high stakes exam prep for some pupils who hopefully, potentially may still be able to sit for their exam soon. Um, and this content is available um, via phone. So parents can literally dial a local phone number um, and they're connected via, they're connected via like a pretty like simple interface where they can click one for the nursery um, lesson, for example, and they're able to hear um, the like one hour lesson over the phone. Um, these um, audio lessons have also been uploaded on the government website. Um, and we're working with the government to also be able to make these um, audio lessons available via radio. Um, and thankfully, the government has been able to partner with MTN, which is the largest telecom in Nigeria, um, to offer the, this mobile phone line and also the um, government website. Um, the phone line is toll free and then the um, government website is at zero data um, for those who can access it um, online. The other learning component that we've created is the interactive mobile quizzes. So these um, are available via WhatsApp um, and via SMS. So these quizzes um, cover a variety of subjects, so similar to the ones covered in the audio lessons, um, and they're available each day. So they're very short quizzes that pupils from primary one all the way up to the junior secondary level can access. Um, it's an opportunity for them just to get some like quick like refreshers, um, go through about five to six questions per quiz um, in the different subjects, um, just to review what they've been learning um, and see like how well they're um, digesting the content that they're getting through the different channels. Um, and again, MTN has been really helpful here um, in ensuring that families can text um, this number or the, send SMSs to this phone number, um, a certain number of texts like each day um, without any cost to them. Additionally, for those um, that have access to WhatsApp, it's also possible for them um, to engage, to, to complete the lessons or sorry, complete the quizzes um, via WhatsApp. Um, then the third learning component we've created is digital storybooks. Um, so these are, these are literal storybooks um, that are going out to pupils um, in, in different grade levels so that they have a lot of like rich um, reading content that they can read through um, so they can keep practicing and keep um, enjoying um, their or developing their like love of reading. Then the fourth learning component that we've designed are lesson guides at home. So this is where parents are brought into um, the program where 
understanding that the parents are not teachers, that they're not specialists. Um, we've designed the learning guides to be really simple um, and also not be very time consuming. Like so many of these other um, learning components are things that pupils can do independently. Um, these lesson guides at home are the one thing that we like want the parents to work on with their child. Um, so these are lessons, very like short lessons in, they're focused in math and English and then one other subject per day. Um, but we're expecting it takes the parents about 45 minutes to go through this lesson um, with their child. And these are available um, via the government Facebook group. Um, they're also available during, um, via their, during, through their um, webpage um, and we're sending them out via the WhatsApp groups. And then the last learning component, which is really powerful, which is also the way that um, really helping us to communicate um, or share so many of these other learning components are the WhatsApp groups or the virtual classrooms that we've created. And we've created two different kinds of WhatsApp groups. Um, one is at the grade level. So, so literally we have one massive um, WhatsApp group for pupils in primary one, another for pupils in primary two. Um, and in these groups are where we're sharing the digital storybooks, for example, um, again, that are like tied to that specific grade level, as well as the lesson guides um, and the um, one other, as well as the lesson guides um, that are available. And the other kind of WhatsApp group that we have are the classroom level WhatsApp groups. So this is ensure this, the class level WhatsApp groups ensure that teachers remain a part of um, the learning process because with these class level groups, it's literally um, groups that the teachers are creating and they're bringing in their, and they're making sure that the pupils um, in their classroom are actually a part of these groups. And certainly not all pupils have access to WhatsApp. Um, so for those pupils who aren't able to connect via WhatsApp, the teachers um, actually give the families calls um, to ask them, find out like what, um, which of these learning compa components, if any, like they've um, been able to access. Um, and also what questions do they have so that parents like aren't left trying to figure out like how to um, manage all these learning components um, sort of like independently but like making sure that the teachers are there as a connection to help the people answer any people questions that may come up um, and ensure that parents feel supported. Um, so those are the learning channels that we've developed. Um, and if we go to the next slide I'll just highlight um, some of the learnings um, that we've had so far. One of the major ones is that a lot of what we're doing should and like can continue to be done like once we're out of this emergency period. Um, we're currently in conversations with um, a number of our government partners about how valuable it is um, to, to still continue some of these learning components, but perhaps at a lower dosage. So instead of having four hours of audio, audio lessons per day, we're looking at maybe having an hour and a half um, because at that point students will have a full day of, of in school um, learning but it's to it would be really good to supplement that and um, still ensure that um, parents feel very comfortable like directly directly communicating with their um, teacher so that their teacher is able to give them a call um, answer, um, answer any questions that the child may have about homework um, so that's one of the key learnings another one is the demographic data is a very very valuable tool um, in designing the program so as part of EdoBest, um, one of the, um, feature of the features of the program has been developing um, digital records for every single pupil. So even before the start um, of this pandemic, we had phone numbers for every single child um, who's enrolled in EdoBest school, which is amazing because it's allowed us to literally send out links um, to each of these, um, everyone, um, so they'll be able to um, quickly enroll in the WhatsApp groups. Um, it's also like made it easier for us to communicate to them about what's happening. Um, but what we've also seen is that it would have been very beneficial for us to have even more layers of data. So for us to know, um, for example, how many of these phones are smartphones and how many of them are future phones, like that'll help us better um, start to plan and understand how many people are likely to be able to access the online content versus those that likely won't and will need to rely more on um, the components that are available via SMS or via phone. And then next slide. And one of our key needs, um, I think I mentioned a couple times that um, the partnership that Edo State Government has been able to develop with MTN, the telecom, has been really powerful in ensuring that parents can access these components um, in a way that's affordable or, or free for them. Um, but not all parents use MTN. So um, one of the things that we've 
that we've been working with Edo State on is um, hoping that they'll also be able to develop partnerships with other major telecoms in Nigeria so that even more families, like if they're on Airtel, for example, is another one, or Glow, um, that they too would be able to um, call or access the website without um, it being very expensive. So that's definitely a major need um, for us. So I'll close there. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Stacy. Um, really insightful information. Um, and I just uh, wanted to point out that uh, there seems to be a, a common thread there um, between your presentation and Henry's, uh, which is one, partnerships uh, that work, and two, that um, we need uh, data light uh, free content uh, I mean, data light and, and uh, data um, free uh, services for a lot of people, especially those living in informal settlements. Um, we'll now go on to our second poll. And uh, then after that, we'll have uh, our last speaker. Um, so the poll question this time, uh, what do you think is the best way to level the playing field for all learners? I'll give uh, everybody a few seconds to fill out that poll and then we'll move on to the third speaker. Please use the chat box to uh, pose any questions to any of our speakers. And also um, you can uh, highlight uh, different things on our AVPA Twitter handle, which is underscore AVPA underscore. So are we getting any submissions to the poll? Yes, Nancy, they're coming in. Uh, so maybe we can give it another five seconds or so for the, the last few people okay. to put their, um, their answers in and then we'll, we'll show the Great. poll. It seems to be working fine now. We'll, we'll show you. it, we'll take another two seconds um, to show the results. Wonderful. I see a few questions coming in for Stacy and Henry, that's great. Once our last speaker has uh, finished his presentation, then we'll go to the question and answers. Okay, let's look at the poll results. Can I get the poll results? Okay, it looks like 74% of you say that uh, governments should provide the tools to all learning to make study from home possible. Uh, and then next in line is zero rate all learning tools so that all children can, le can learn at the same pace remotely. I think that's really important because I think uh, we all are, are pretty sure that remote learning will become uh, something that we all have to be become comfortable with. Okay, thank you. So we're now moving on to our third uh, and last speaker for today. His name is Mike Kipkorir Bill. Mike is the CEO of Elewa and um, he is based in Kenya. Over to you, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. So, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, a comment on that slide. Um, I was the CEO of Belewa until uh, 30th of April. So uh, I just transitioned into my new venture, which is called uh, Verb Education. Um, I was the co-founder of uh, Elewa, uh, and, uh, and uh, what we're doing at Verb is very similar to what we're doing at Elewa. The reason uh, I decided to create VAB ahead of Elewa was in order to be able to focus more on some of the things which were really uh, expanding Elewa's mandate beyond where it wanted to go. So we have, we, we, it's a discussion we've been having for a long time and we thought the best decision is to sort of uh, create a new entity and that's the entity I'm leading now. My co-founder uh, continues to lead uh, Elewa. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so um, 
Uh, because of that, therefore, if you look for verb education on the internet, you will not find us anywhere. If you try to look for anything related to the new entity, you will hardly see anything. Uh, we are using this month to sort of really establish ourselves, but we are active in terms of uh, our work with clients and uh, everything that we do. So uh, just to speak about uh, the current activity, uh, or even before that, the presentation I have, therefore, uh, the, 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 the presentation I have here, therefore, is a really summarized presentation that just shows um, uh, some of the highlights of the things that we are doing. So I'll begin with the current activity. Uh, uh, it really worked and so teachers education and the teacher that class it can as education learning separate level anyone education uh, for us educators to go to the uh, do the uh, and tool use is main activity uh, just found them but better as opposed to expertise on uh, their various uh, specialized areas so our training is mainly revolve, uh, mainly revolves around creativity in terms of how to deliver tools Tools are some of the things that we uh, put at their disposal for them to be able to overcome the challenge before them. Now, a lot of times we favor working with tools that exist. Uh, for example, we are all using Zoom right now to, to, uh, to have this conversation. So these are tools that exist that we really recommend. And in some cases, we actually build tools for them. And I can uh, give you some of the examples of that. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a game changer for us. And uh, the biggest thing that it has changed for us is suddenly conversations are easier to have. So people who are very well established, uh, people who never thought that they needed um, to rethink some of their models, especially some of our education institutions, which really, which really run on legacy systems and legacy mindsets, uh, have suddenly seen the value of a lot of the things we, uh, we've been talking about. Now, um, we do a whole bunch of things and I'll try that this slide does not necessarily tell you everything that we do, but I can summarize it um, verbally and use the example listed there to highlight how it is. The main thing we do is, for example, uh, instructional design, content development, and e-learning platforms for entities such as universities. Uh, the e-learning has been with us for a long time. I know universities that uh, invested in e-learning in 2006 and to date they have nothing to speak of. Why is that the problem? The main problem is nothing to do with the technology, nothing to do with the students. Most of the problems based on the research and the engagement that we've had with these people over time has always been the lecturers. Like how do we actually get the instructors in those institutions to be able to come on board? And uh, with one of our clients we've, we've, we've really made very big steps um, uh, regarding this. Uh, you know, things things to do with uh, lecturer contracts, uh, you know, just the way the education is delivered online, ETC. We've really made a lot of progress as far as that is concerned. Now, the other things also that we try and do is, uh, when it comes to the various tools and uh, approaches that we develop, we tend to, we tend to do, um, uh, we, we tend to create prototypes of uh, things. So whenever there's a problem somewhere, like for example, teachers are struggling to assess students. Uh, we, we, we tend to work with them to develop a prototype of that. We try to run it as an MVP. And thereafter, if it qualifies, you know, we can run it fully as a product. Uh, so for example, in the technical and vocational training space, this is one of the most difficult spaces to think about uh, how to deliver education online or in a blended way. And that's something that we're working right now uh, with the, the regulator of technical training here in Kenya and some technical training institutions here to try and see how we can still help learning to go on in that space. Some countries have experience in that and uh, we're basically trying to see what works best with our context. The other thing, of course, is the 
is the uh, teacher training for basic education. Once again, we've done some amazing uh, experiments and prototypes uh, in this space. For example, uh, just before this COVID thing, between January and March this year, we held um, a very interesting uh, teacher training via WhatsApp on competency-based assessment. And we were very surprised by you know, just how well teachers were actually learning how to do competency-based assessment via our WhatsApp-led training. So just minified trainings that we were able to deliver via WhatsApp and we're able to also give them feedback based on what they do. So such things. Next slide, please. I'm aware the time is short. So the biggest learnings basically that we've had is uh, people really have the capacity to transform the way they do things and relatively quickly at that. That I think you've seen it. So I don't even need to elaborate it, but people really have the capacity because the will is there right now. The other thing is um, uh, people are trying out all kinds of different things uh, to be able to do things. But in Kenya in particular, we really suffer from the central command syndrome, you know, like, like you know, this is government has not directed or, uh, or, you know, government has not approved, that kind of thing. That has significantly limited the imagination that school managers have. Everyone wants to play it safe. No one wants to try the risky thing. People only want to try that which has, you know, uh, which that which they've seen has been agreed to elsewhere. And that I think, you know, uh, we lose so many opportunities and a lot of time that way. It even goes back to this a certain survey we did uh, about three weeks into this COVID pandemic here in Kenya with primary school teachers. And 50% of them said they are doing nothing uh, online. They are doing absolutely nothing. And the main reason for that is there's no directive. Uh, that they've received, you know, it's not clear to them what they're supposed to do. The other big one, of course, is higher education. Most higher education institutions are really struggling for relevance. They really see it as a big problem because if a bigger university can do a program you've been doing online and do it better, not even a bigger university, anyone, if they're doing the same thing you've been doing online, you know, you're in deep trouble. So uh, there's, there's, there's really a big struggle for relevance and we are trying to help people there. And finally, the Commission for University in Kenya, I believe, finally will be able to change some of their thinking about online education and, 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 and basically to help investors to pivot to the new uh, uh, space. Because there is, for example, a requirement in Kenya that to be a university, you have to have 50 acres of land. So, you know, and that really stops very many people just from innovating, especially, you know, as, as land becomes more and more difficult to get. And education can be done in a blended way or in partnership with others, you know. So the, all those are the difficult things. So next slide, please, for help needed. Uh, the biggest help I think we need for us is uh, since we do a lot of experiments and since we try to really run very many uh, prototypes on how to deliver all sorts of aspects of education, uh, sometimes we put things on hold because it's simply not worth it uh, to be able to uh, to do it. Uh, so, you know, if we can find a partner with whom we can run some of these experiments really quickly, that can be amazing. And also, uh, instructional designers and content developers is uh, a big need we have because imagination, creativity is not a very easy thing uh, to have in this market of ours, mainly because of the way people have traditionally been trained. So, that is a big area that we are we uh, we've, we we really normally invest in as you know as as a company. We always really try and invest very hard in uh, growing our people and making sure that they can be creative so that they liberate themselves and they can be able to reach out to people. Uh, yeah, that's just about it. And uh, just a final comment on the survey we did with primary school teachers. When we ask them what they therefore need in order to be able to uh, to to do something different during this COVID pandemic, about 42% of them say that they need training on how to uh, deliver using technology, obviously. About 25%, which is the next group, says that they basically need overall training on pedagogy, uh, which is the science of delivery. And uh, about 17% say they need uh, uh, help uh, to be able to think and deliver creatively. And something that surprised me was about 8% of them say they would like training or they would like some help on how to curb loneliness. That was a very big surprise for me. And maybe loneliness is not the right word, but that's how it came out from them. But I think there's a lot of uh, psychological effects that this has had on them. You know, as teachers, you're used to being able to deliver in a certain way. Now you have 
to deliver in a different way. So yeah, that 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 really surprised us, and that was I thought was an interesting thing. I'd like to stop there because of time, and uh, happy to take questions, etc. And thank you all for listening and for uh, having me here. Thank you very much. Uh, your last comment, Mike, uh, is uh, it, it might have been you know a surprise uh, in your in your research, uh, but interestingly enough, there have been some chats. Uh, some people have been chatting on the side about that exact comment, uh, that exact issue, yeah. uh, basically saying yeah. that continued learning is not possible without acknowledging the psychosocial uh, issues affecting children and caregivers, like food, yeah. insecurity, increased violence, yeah. uh, depression, all these things. And, and I yeah. realize, you know, the learning uh, issue can't be, it can't, can't be standalone, but we couldn't, we couldn't include everything in this one, uh, one webinar. Um, so we will be discussing some of these issues. In fact, our, our next, next week, we're hoping to discuss uh, gender violence and domestic violence um, because, you know, that is escalating due to COVID-19. So these are definitely issues that we know are affecting people um, uh, while, while they're also trying to, to um, yeah. keep up uh, learning. So thank you very much, Mike. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, you, I see too. some questions have come in. I see some questions have come in for Henry and for Stacy. If you have any questions specifically for Mike, also please put them in the chat box. So we'll go to the question and answer uh, uh, section of our webinar now. Uh, I know we're running a bit late. Uh, we may spill over the the, the hour um, set for this webinar, whoever's uh, interested in staying on, please do. Um, Henry, we had a question for you. What are the different approaches available for uh, uh, different learning phases uh, that's, that are not too overwhelming for learners and parents? Basically, you know, balancing between um, the sound uh, uh, science behind learning, but also, you know, what people are going through. Thanks, um, Nancy. Yeah, so I, it's an interesting question. And I think, um, let me just start by saying that what, was, what also came out in our um, a content curation process um, is that there was a preponderance or a, a dominance of uh, content available for the higher grades. So typically your um, senior secondary, uh, grade 10 and 11, 11 and 12, and, and not as much for the lower grades. Um, there was also, um, uh, they tend to be a focus on the maths and the science rather than um, some of the other um, other subjects. So uh, that was the one thing that came out. Um, in terms of the differentiated approaches, look, I think um, that's something that everybody's grappling with in terms of how do we then apply low tech solutions. Um, I know the Siemens uh, Stifting uh, people are in the group today, for example, and one of the initiatives and through the STEAM Foundation here in South Africa is around cooperative learning um, and hands on minds on science learning. And now this is something that we're grappling with as um, uh, I think everybody in responding to uh, how do we deal with what would normally be a very tactile learning experience in terms of setting up experiments. So how do we now look at simulations and other versions of this, but really without taking away um, the quality of learning that should be happening in this kind of um, subject. So I think it's something that we are grappling with. Um, and definitely there is a disparity in terms of the grade levels. Um, and I think I'd also like to just touch on the psychosocial uh, support, because I think what we saw with the lack of a parent, sort of like a really good quality parent guide um, that, that supports parents to, to ensure learning in, 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 in the home, is that there are also the social and emotional, um, social and emotional learning aspects um, which need to be addressed. So, I mean, I don't think I have a really, I don't have an answer, um, but certainly it is something that, that came out in the work that you were doing. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Stacy. a question for you. Um, are you able to track how students engage with lessons and other material on your platform or how are you measuring engagement and gains? We are. So for, we're able, the SUBEB team, so the government team is able to track traffic on their website to get an understanding of 
how many people are downloading the materials, um, as well as like where those people are coming from, like whether it's in Edo State or actually from like other places um, in Nigeria or outside of it. Um, in addition to that, we're able, um, through the WhatsApp groups, we're able to see, um, understand the level of engagement, how many parents are understand, understand how many parents are actually in the groups, how many parents don't have access to the groups um, and need to be called by um, the teachers. Then the third way that we're um, able to track um, usage is through the um, phone line. So being able to see how many SMSs are going out, um, how, because each like, SMS is tied to the actual phone number. Um, so knowing how many students are engaging um, in the interactive quizzes through that, and then as well as understanding um, how many calls are being made to the phone line to get the audio lessons. Okay, what on average, what are, what are you seeing? How, how high is engagement? So there, so it's a, I can speak most to um, the traffic that we're seeing so far on the website. Um, well, I'll start by explaining the figures okay. for Idaho State generally. So we've just, <laughs> from, so just speaking of government schools, there are government schools from nursery level all the way to junior secondary. There are 357,000 um, pupils across the state. Um, and in those numbers, um, We've been able to, I can talk to you in terms of percentages, not the like absolute numbers in terms of um, like how many okay. people are yeah. using it. So what we're seeing and what we're um, working with um, Subab to um, change is that a lot of the traffic um, so far that we're seeing is coming for the online content is coming from um, a good proportion, like 20% is coming from Edo, but then a, a significant per percentage of the traffic is actually coming from Lagos, which is interesting, um, but we think it has a lot to do with the fact that in Lagos, like they tend to like have families who um, have more money and it, it's easier for them to um, access the um, website. Um, but it's also um, that we're like working really closely with teachers um, and also the headmasters to um, ensure that there's good communication so they understand um, what's available to them like on the website. Because um, a lot of the Edo families, they're getting it directly through the WhatsApp groups rather than going to the website to get it um, because it's shared to them directly. Whereas um, people outside of Edo State, like they, they're not in the WhatsApp group, so they can't, the only way for them to get it is through the website. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a question for you, Mike. Um, one of our uh, listeners disagrees with the view that universities are struggling to remain relevant. He just wanted to know if, are you working directly with universities in metropolitan hubs and um, yep. are they seeing the opportunity this opportunity to really shift yeah that that's actually a really good question uh, the situation here in Kenya is uh, interesting because of the way supply supply of students into universities is controlled uh, for example the last three years, government has only allowed about 100,000 uh, students to be admitted into the 72, 73 universities we have in the country here. And you find that uh, last year, for example, there was a lot of pressure to even merge some programs, close down some programs, shut down some institutions, that kind of pressure that came up. So right now, like with the university we work with right now, they are a bit afraid because there are relatively smaller universities that is in a metropolitan area, they, uh, they are afraid that some of their competitors or, 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 or some of the other universities which offer similar programs could take away the students they would traditionally have taken because of geography advantages, simply because they are a bigger brand, a better name. So there's that struggle for relevance. That's what I meant. Um, it's not necessarily, it may not necessarily be the case elsewhere, well, maybe there's a lot of pressure on universities to admit even more and more. But um, in uh, some of the cases, at least with the cases that I'm dealing with right now, that's a real issue. Like the struggle for relevance, how do we make sure that we can offer things that are good? The other thing that I see also along these lines, and this is maybe just further down the road, huh? e-learning will very quickly become a commodity, meaning it will be, you know, everyone can deliver it, everyone will be claiming they can deliver it and do it. So the issue is going to become what kind of e-learning are you delivering? How good is it? How effective is it? How does it engage people? How does it help people transition into work? So that 
I think is part of the struggle for relevance because a lot of these uh, bigger entities or entities that can Quality. train thousands at uh, at the same time may not necessarily be able to transmit a quality program as somebody has said there, yeah. So yeah, indeed, that's that's maybe what I meant by the struggle yeah. for relevance. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, there's been some conversation in the chat also about quality as opposed to, you know, is it available on certain devices? Why are we not really thinking about quality? So that's a good point you raised, Mike. Yeah. Uh, Henry, we have uh, yep. a question for you. Uh, what's the role of private sector in expanding access to education? What do you think that is? Apart from, we know the telecom uh, companies have, have you know, played a big role, but what do you think uh, private sector can do? What else can they do to expand access to education? Well, um, I think, so I think, I don't know what the situation is like in the rest of Africa, but certainly in South Africa, the private sector is a significant contributor uh, to education, certainly on the non-profit education side of things. So organizations working to support um, non-profits working in education. And now a lot of that work is, is around supporting the system and supporting system change. So, um, but I think under the COVID-19 situation, I think we reflect on that particularly, um, I think it's, really, um, so besides the telcos, as you say, um, is to continue to support nonprofits working in education so that they can support the most vulnerable because that is really where the big gaps are. So being able to close that gap, uh, for example, we're working with some of our partners to deliver paper-based resources to parents to support learning in the home. Um, and I think this is a critical gap that needs to be closed. Um, but I think also just to say um, that if we think about system change, and one of the important things that we need to maybe use this as an opportunity, and I think there's some be a very interesting work that, that came out of the Civil Society Coalition, for example, around how do we build back better? Um, so um, let's not go back, let's not return from the COVID-19 lockdowns and the close, the, the closing. So if we're going to, we've sacrificed so much and our children have sacrificed so much um, during this time, let's not go back um, to the same, uh, failing systems um, that exist. Let's try to build back better and make sure that um, uh, we use this disaster as an opportunity to put pressure on government, to put pressure on maybe the corporate sector um, and other civil society organizations to really support a better system in the future. One that should another pandemic, should another uh, disaster face us, that we're not going to be having these conversations to say, why are our most vulnerable affected the most? Uh, Henry, I think you made the perfect closing remarks. <laughs> Those are really great remarks. How, how do we build better and not go back? And we know that um, if it's not another COVID-19 uh, crisis, there will be something that, you know, uh, that affects us uh, across the world. Uh, and, and maybe even regionally. So we need to start thinking about even past COVID. Um, thank you so much to all the speakers. I wish we had more time. I do want uh, very quickly, if, uh, if Margaret, you could go to the last slide, um, just to talk about uh, some of, I have a few announcements uh, before everybody jumps off. Um, good news uh, is that we had in one of our uh, webinars, uh, we actually had uh, one of our speakers get some support from um, one of the banks in Kenya. Uh, Lifesong was able to connect and has now donors who are, are helping uh, feed and uh, um, feed and give money to uh, more than 30 families, needy families in some of our uh, very densely populated um, informal set settlements like Kangemi, Kibera, and Kawangwari. So that's great news. We're really happy to hear that Lifesong Kenya were able to get some support. Um, and then talking about upcoming webinars, as I mentioned before, we do want to have our next webinar will be on the subject of uh, gender and domestic abuse because we realize you know, people can't even learn if, if, if those kind of things are going on in the homestead. So we do want to address that issue. 
Uh, and the one following that, uh, the week after, will have access to affordable and adequate healthcare in informal uh, settlements or highly den dense, uh, densely populated uh, uh, areas. And again, we'd like to have representatives from uh, across the continent, uh, especially Nigeria and South Africa, because we have offices there. Um, we'd love to have people speak on, on, on those subjects. So if you have any um, ideas on who you'd like to hear from, please let us know. Um, we are also thinking of changing, possibly changing the format a little bit of our webinars. And we'd like, by a show of hands, uh, what people, we'd, we'd like to know what people think. Uh, somebody had actually suggested that the format should uh, be more like a hackathon uh, round table uh, where we try to find tangible solutions that can be easily and quickly implemented. Uh, if you like that idea, please put your hand up and give us uh, one or two suggestions regarding the particular problem you think we need to hack. Um, I can see already one or two hands up. Uh, give us some ideas on the problem you'd like us to hack. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, AVPA, uh, we are now uh, putting out a questionnaire, which will be sent to you shortly, uh, asking about your ideas for pre-COVID initiatives. As Henry said, we have to start building, we have to start thinking past uh, COVID-19. We've seen what it has done to our economies and our communities. Um, so what are the opportunities that we need to look at to, to start preparing for a post-COVID uh, post -COVID world? So we will be sending uh, that questionnaire out and we hope you will uh, have time to answer a few questions and give us some ideas. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you can see there's information there if you want to get in touch with any of us at AVPA, um, myself, Nancy, there's Rachel Keeler, Toyin in Nigeria, and in South Africa, Dr. Frank Aswani. I think uh, our CEO has, uh, has left us. He had a hard uh, a cutoff, but I just want to, on his behalf and on behalf of uh, our partners, Sankalp Dialogue, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a great discussion. And we hope uh, you will continue to give us your feedback. Uh, let us know what you like, what you dislike, and where you'd like us to go from here. Thank you so much.